Hi, I'm Teddy, and you're listening to Layla Zayden, the president and CEO of Millennial Action Project on Two Birds Talking Politics. Get your vaccine and wear a mask. Hi everyone, I am Kelly and this is Two Broads Talking Politics. I am on today with Layla Zayden, who is the president and CEO of the Millennial Action Project. Hi Layla. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for joining me. Uh, so I'm going to start with the most obvious question, which is what is the Millennial Action Project? So Millennial Action Project works to train a generation of young elected officials to help our democracy function better. We're working with them to turn them into bridge builders, into coalition builders, and ultimately to pass innovative, future-oriented legislation that serves our generation and and, uh, ultimately really hand our democracy, a better democracy, to the generation behind us. We work with 1,600 young elected officials across the country, both in state legislatures and in Congress, primarily through something called the Future Caucus which is a group of bipartisan elected officials who work together not only to to write, introduce, and pass legislation, but also really to create a permission structure for them to build relationships across the aisle in the first place. And, you know, I would say our, our theory of change is that when you can make your generational identity more important than your partisan identity, then you can really start to focus on issues and really start to focus on solving problems. And and that really unlocks some solutions that you never would have seen or or considered otherwise. We think of Congress, the House of Representatives, as being super dysfunctional and, you know, completely along partisan lines right now and everything's broken. Does that caucus, uh, which is bipartisan, do they find that, that they can do that, that they can make the generational become more important than the the party affiliation, you know, how how does that work in practice? Yeah, absolutely. And and I got to say the the pandemic has been tough because one of my favorite parts of the job I'm I'm based here in DC is actually just going to the hill and and getting to introduce people to each other, people across mm-hmm. the aisle who never would have had the opportunity to meet each other because as a member of Congress, your days are ultra ultra scheduled and unless it's sort of a, you know, a a party event or maybe a fundraiser that evening or, uh, you know, a committee meeting is maybe where you would have the opportunity to meet somebody across the aisle. There's not a whole lot of of places or times for you to just build those relationships with other people. And so part of my job is is really creating um, that reason, that excuse for them to come together. And and I'll say it's been it's been really remarkable um, to watch them just find ways to to think outside the box and to think about um, who it is they were sent to D.C. to serve. In this past Congress, so far, we've had about 25 pieces of legislation introduced, um, a lot of them centering around services for veterans, um, some related to COVID, um, as well as things around workforce development and technology. And you see them sort of thinking about who needs my help and how can I find somebody? How can I reach out to anybody to, to help me help them? And, and I'll also just quickly note, you know, young people we in Congress, we're, we're super generous. We, we consider anyone 45 years old and younger uh, <laughs> eligible for, for our caucus. <clears throat> Apparently I am a millennial. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and relatively speaking, I mean, you do see a, a shift in how, Folks who are under that cutoff think about um, governing and and finding solutions um, compared to some of their older counterparts. And although there's only about um, 80, 85 of them roughly in Congress currently, they represent 86 million people across the country. So so right now, you know, young people in Congress represent about one in four Americans. And I think that's a huge opportunity, not just to pass some meaningful structural change, but also create some culture change around um, problem solving and modeling that back in their districts. 
So I am 42, and I don't often think of myself as a young person, although I'd love to. <laughs> Uh, but compared to the average age of a member of Congress or a member of a state legislature, it is young. It's really young. So what are the kinds of challenges uh, that millennials uh, or this you know, sort of group that we're calling millennials uh, that they face in dealing with people who have maybe been in office for decades and decades, who maybe do feel like this group is sort of young, you know, what, what sorts of challenges do they see? Yeah. Well, just like in any job, I think there's always sort of a, a power dynamic, right? When you come in and you have fresh ideas and you have ways of sort of shaking things up that you're interested in um, that run up against an entrenched political culture that, um, those who currently hold the power are not incentivized to to change or to share. And I think what's what's kind of interesting about this unique moment that we're in now is that the traditional gatekeepers of, of power and influence um, are shifting, right? Like people can get their message out in ways that don't require these traditional power structures to, to be on their side. And I think when AOC ran, she she showed you know what you can do with twitter how you can reach how you can reach an audience um, without having to rely on newspapers or traditional media outlets um i think <laughs> we're all familiar with how a certain president also used <laughs> twitter to uh to kind of cut out sort of traditional gatekeepers and i i think you know what 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 we see that as is is sort of an opportunity to leverage not just technology, but shifting ways of, of connecting with one another. And I think that brings a lot of power into, into the legislature, into Congress, into states, when, when young people say, I have, I have the people behind me, and here's, here's what they are asking me to do. Um, and we see that time and time again, especially on issues like climate change, um, criminal justice reform, that there is a bipartisan demand and, and appetite for action um, that really empower, I think, members to to sort of advocate for change in um, pretty compelling ways. Um, that being said, I do think there's some some challenges in sort of getting millennial representation and um, more representative sort of bodies in legislatures in the first place. The first is just sort of campaign finance, right? Like people have to raise a ton of money to run for office, and that's often a a barrier. And, and, you know, the second is in state legislatures in particular is like a lot of them really don't get paid to do this work. So even if you've raised all this money um, and you manage to, to get into the legislature, now you're having to do two or three or four side hustles just to make ends meet. And if you're a young person, you might have a young family too. So that just sort of compounds um, the challenges. And so where Millennial Action Project steps in is really to help support these these new members and give them the, the resources that they might not otherwise have access to so that they can focus on, on their main job, which is really focusing on public policy and, and, and solving problems for their constituents. Are there lessons, do you think, from from the ways you've been able to get people who don't necessarily share a party affiliation who may disagree on some issues, but you are able to connect them and, and bring them together to talk. Are there ways we can sort of take the lessons from that and extend that beyond just the people who are currently in office to, uh, you know, people who might be thinking about getting involved in uh, it, maybe not in, a, in an elected office, but getting involved in, in politics in their community in some way and encourage people to be talking to each other more about issues, bringing together ideas? Yeah, I think it's such a great question because the the problem of political polarization is not something that is just limited to um, our elected leaders, but we're seeing that in just our own interactions and our own unwillingness to to have uncomfortable conversations with people who we disagree with, or in, in a lot of cases, frankly, even to meet people who we disagree with. Like, well, you know, a lot of our, our own social networks are very reflective of sort of the choices and, and values and preferences that we hold. I think there, there's a few, um, a few, a few lessons I think that are transferable. And the first is, 
um, as a society and I think as, as a country, we're very focused on sort of checking boxes and getting to the end and sort of like diving to, okay, well, here's, here's like what we have to do. Here's, here's sort of like the end goal and this is what we're doing. And a lot of the time, you, you don't get there unless you've invested in building the relationships and building the infrastructure and building the trust that, that has to necessarily precede the action being taken. And, and so um, I'll put that in context. Before I worked at Millennial Action Project, um, I worked at the Center for American Progress at Generation Progress doing youth organizing. Um, and so I have, a, I have a field organizer's background. And so I very much sort of bring that lens with me into, into this work. And, you know, the thing about youth organizing is that you can't use them as an ATM for votes every time an election rolls around, mm. because that is a surefire way to just turn off your electorate and, and burn them out and send a message that you don't really care about them as a person. You just want them when you have something that you need to accomplish. And so, you know, the, the advocacy work that, that I did at CAP was very much about investing in the infrastructure, investing in the people, um, investing in their needs, and really strengthening those bonds so that when it came time to respond to a crisis or make a really complex, difficult decision, the network was mobilized and was able to not just have trust in each other, but have the skills and um, trust in, in me um, to, to really work together and get something done. And I think um, that's the lens in which we organize the future caucus members, but I think it's something that can be applied in communities and in, you know, in, in workplaces and in university settings. Like, I, I think the idea of just not jumping to the end, but really starting at the beginning, almost, almost slowing down. Um, I think, I think that allows you to, to be ready to do some of the, the urgent and, and important work that we're trying to, to, to sort of like force right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think uh, if we can, I, I like that idea of slowing down. I think social media really forces us to, to speed up everything and, uh, and the idea, and and maybe once we're past uh, COVID and people can get together in person again, there will be this sort of renewed excitement around having these face to face conversations, uh, and that might be a good opportunity to 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 really have those conversations. Yeah, yeah, and I I don't want to give the sense that um, I'm saying that we should ignore some of the the pressing issues that mm -hmm. our generation is, is impacted by, right? Like big intractable existential issues like, like climate and race and, and issues of, um, of, of criminal justice. Those are problems that, you know, we can't really slow down on those. Mm -hmm. Like we can't not tackle that. Um, but we also have to be calling people in. We have to be finding ways to, to, to build, um, to build bonds with, um, with others so that we can, um, you know, we can, we can build the coalitions that we need to tackle these issues. And we're seeing with our network, at least um, with the young folks that we work on, that we work with, um, that, that they are, they are getting results. And especially in state legislatures, we're seeing them, um, you know, not shy away from some of these pretty tricky and, and difficult issues. So I would like to to talk about some action items. How can our listeners uh, get involved in the work that the Millennial Action Project is doing, and and what are some things that you would like them to be to be thinking about? Yeah, well, you can visit us at millennialaction.org, and I always have to remind myself of this when I type it. But millennial has two L's and two <laughs> N's. <laughs> um, as a millennial, you'd think that it would be sort of uh, auto-programmed, but it's not. Um, and, and on our website, you can see the states in which we have future caucuses. And of course, we have members who work in all 50 states. And what I would say is um, reach out to them, right? Like this is a network of, of young people who have said that they want to break down the barriers between our civic institutions and, and the young people. Um, and the constituents who who sent them there. And so 
they've indicated just by them being a part of the Future Caucus, by being part of the MAP network, they've indicated a willingness to listen um, and to be open-minded and to, to work with, with everyone and to, to work with you. And so if you're listening to, to this right now, you know, join, join our email list, find out about events that might be happening virtually or in your state once we can do in-person events again, and, and just plug in to connect with the legislators who I think are, are genuinely interested in modeling the highest ideals of public service and um, solving problems that are urgent to their, their constituencies. So as the group of millennials gets a little bit older, and in fact, we now have Generation Z voting as well, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what what does that look like to, to think about being sort of the young people and representing the youth vote and then become the, the mentors to the next generation? Yeah, I think we're at a really exciting time for, for youth power. Um, you know, this past election cycle, we tracked a 266% increase in millennial candidates. And millennials are the second most diverse generation. The most diverse generation is is Gen Z. And so we're seeing sort of this pipeline extend of, of young people who are thinking about politics differently and who are seeing, who are seeing our democracy and who are seeing public service as an actual viable way to, to solve problems and, and to fix things. Um, and I think that uh, as, as we extend that, that pipeline and as we build more and more um, of these types of, of public servants, of these types of elected leaders, we're going to reach a tipping point inside Congress, inside state legislatures, where you know, we'll, we'll no longer be, as you mentioned earlier, right? Like swimming up against the the current toxic political culture being set by maybe people who 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 are uh, more loath to to let go of of some power they're going the this generation of young people is is taking it we're taking that power and then we're setting the culture we're no longer swimming up against it we're setting it and so i see as as millennials sort of rise up into leadership roles into you know uh, maybe they become a, a senator, a governor, a president, um, we see more and more young people stepping in and, and that's it's sort of reimagining what it can look like, what our democracy can look like, who our democracy is for and what it can do. Is there anything else that you want to make sure we talk about today? Yeah, I, you know, I would love to just talk about briefly, I think the, the connection between building infrastructure in terms of connecting young people across difference and um, just one specific example of a bill or a, a series of legislation that 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 was really important to our democracy, which was vote by mail in this most recent election. You know, our our goal is to not just help legislators pass bipartisan legislation, but to truly, you know, train them to to build relationships, to um, be role models and to build credibility among young people in our civic institutions to solve problems. And um, when the pandemic hit last year, we knew that our our election was was at risk, right? Like like many people, we saw absentee voting and and vote by mail as as one of many solutions to um, ensure that people could safely vote. And so we were able to, because we had invested in sort of the infrastructure and the muscle and the civic muscle of this group, really rapidly deploy legislators across the country, across all of the states that we work in, to, um, you know, pass vote by mail laws in their legislatures. And, and pretty quickly we saw um, some, some, quick, some quick successes. And then we realized that the problem was not a lack of laws. The problem in a lot of places was a lack of credibility. And in particular, you know, re- many Republicans being sort of skeptical of, of the security of, of absentee voting. And so that's where this trust factor Actor comes in, and we were able to, in Wisconsin in particular, work with our Republican and Democratic legislatures to do civic in, civic events, um, film PSAs, do social media Q and As, really go on the record to assure their constituents that they had a variety of different options to vote safely, including vote by mail, but also voting early, voting in person with appropriate PPE, 
And in post-election analysis, we saw that districts represented by a Republican legislator who participated in our work actually had a 5% bump in absentee voting compared to other Republican districts. And so, so the work of trust building, you know, which, which we had no idea that the pandemic was coming, but doing that work on the front end made it so that when the pandemic hit and this, this issue of vote by mail became such a political sort of football, right? Like it was just so split down the middle of um, what people believe that our, our network was able to say, um, no, that's, that's actually um, not a political issue. This is about voting and we're going to use our voices and our platforms to say so. Um, and so that gives me hope for, for the future that as more and more of these sort of polarizing issues come to, to the national consciousness, our, our network can be leaders in, in sort of lowering the temperature there and depolarizing it and actually transcending it in order to um, build credibility in the system, but, um, you know, build, build credibility with their voters. I love that. What a fantastic example. Uh, well, Layla, thank you so much for speaking with me today uh, and for the work that Millennial Action Project is doing. Uh, you know, we tend to be fairly partisan on this show, and so it's good uh, to step back and to think about these places where uh, where we can be bi- bipartisan, where we can extend the conversation. I think, you know, I feel very strongly that uh, that the the lack of talking to each other <laughs> is a real problem right now. And uh, I love this. Uh, I love that you're doing this work to, to build this trust and to encourage these conversations. Yeah, absolutely, Kelly. And, and I'll just say, you know, I think if you are, you are a partisan or you are nonpartisan, if you care about any issue, then we need the system to work. And this is about fixing the system so that any issue that we care about, be it climate, criminal justice, you know, democracy reform itself um, has a fighting chance of, of making progress. And so I'm, I'm really honored to be doing this work. And I have a lot of hope for the future that um, we're not too far off from a from a big tipping point where um, I think progress on these issues is, is, is very much in reach. Excellent. Well, we don't always have uh, hopeful ends to episodes, but that is hopeful and wonderful. So <laughs> thank you, Layla. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.